you would like to be a part of my, there we are, if you want to be a part of my essential staff and crew on Sunday morning to assist us with the production, um, I'd be glad to talk to you of what we need. And uh, just even having a face uh, in strategic places helps me be a better preacher because of that I can share. And I, I think I sound better when I'm looking at people, just like as I'm, life, I'm rifling through pages right now, as you know, and then as I look up and see friendly faces, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. And so um, you can scoot over to the side there a little bit. This is a pendant, <laughs> Independence Weekend, and I tell you, last night with all of the fireworks and celebrations going on, it uh, sounded like a lot of people were grateful to be free uh, and live in this country. Um, one of the things I had as a thought for Independence Day is that um, take time and say thank you to the person or persons who were instrumental in leading you to your faith in Christ. Those who have um, taught you and, and led you and encouraged you along the way. Um, I actually, uh, I have a shout out to uh, Dwayne, Smitty, and Bill. Um, you three made an impact on my life for the Lord, and I've already hit Facebook up this morning and left one message, and I'll, t I'll try and chase the rest of you down later. But what I'm saying, and that, that's my illustration, is that take time out and talk to the person who um, helped you in your faith. If that person has passed on and, and gone to be with the Lord, well, contact their family. Let their, their sons and daughters know how much uh, their parent meant to you. So that's one of the challenges I have for you. I mean, we're, we're a church without walls, and we basically um, are kind of locked into our, our own situations. Why not take advantage of it? The Internet's a wonderful place used properly. So that's what I have for you today as an introduction, uh, as by way of, uh, of uh, to let you know what we have planned today. Uh, once again, we're testing the microphone. This may be a video and audio, or maybe an audio-only message. Either way, we're going to uh, do our best in, in preaching the, the Word of God and, and proclaim Christ. Also, at the end of today's worship service, we will be having communion. Um, so please, take this opportunity and um, find your communion uh, items, your, your, your own juice, um, your own bread, and have that as a special time and share that with us at the end of this church service. Let's start, though, with a word of prayer as our uh, musicians uh, come up and get ready for uh, leading us in worship. But Father, we want to just thank you now. We thank you that we are free, whom the Son has set free. We are free indeed, and it's in Christ we only experience freedom, freedom from sin and the guilt of sin, the judgment of sin. And Lord, we're grateful for that. You have released us from our bondage. Uh, you have broken our chains, and we stand with you in your righteousness. So Father, we just thank you for that. It's our first opening thought. We ask that you would build on that today in our worship service. As we come to you, we offer you our praise. We offer you um, ourselves in a manner that only you can handle, that you take us, you change us, you grow us, and you equip us for your service. It's in Christ's name we thank you and praise you. Amen.
I just felt led to uh, come on up on that song because it talks about uh, break my heart with what breaks yours. And I, I just want to take a minute and pray pray for our, uh, our church family. Give us a second to, to sit, relax, and drink it in um, that we're actually in the presence of the Holy Lord. Imagine this auditorium is not empty. It's full. That God is in the place. He fills the, the temple. His majesty is what creates the, the fullness of the worship experience. It's not just a few people meeting together because COVID-19 rules say we can't be here together. But what we have is we have an audience of one. Our worship is an audience of one. And you know that because I don't sing for you. If you stand near me, you know I'm not singing for you. I'm singing because the Lord hears it and accepts it. And you as well. When you, whether you're at home, sitting in front of your, your computer, or watching it on the, the smart TV, or even just off your, streaming it off your phone, this is your worship with God. And when it says, break my heart with what breaks yours, God desires worship. He desires fellowship. He created us for fellowship. Not that he needed us, but he desired it to share it. Today, as we get ready to go into another letter of, of uh, Revelation, as we study instruction directed at a church. I just want to start with a word of prayer again. I felt earlier very defeated because I really don't know if this microphone is working, whether we'll be able to use the video, and I felt defeated and frustrated because I thought I had it worked out. But that's what Satan wants. Satan wants us to feel defeated with the small things, things that really don't matter. takes our eyes off of God. So I want to focus 
on God. I want to, to make it my decision. And I want you to make it your decision right now. You may not have known why you, you clicked on and are, are watching this video or listening to it. But really, I want to let you know that this is your time with God. Make it personal. Make it count. Let's once again pray. Father, we're about to open up your word. And we want to come before you humbly, Lord. We want to admit that we're distracted by what's around us. We're easily distracted by what's around us. So, Father, give us the ability through your Holy Spirit to touch base with you, to connect. Microphones and, and phones may not be connecting with the video and audio, but you certainly are here and connect with us. Open our hearts, Lord. Open our eyes as well so we may see the spiritual fruit that's hanging before us, that we may take and eat. I pray for my church, Father, my friends. I pray, Father, wherever they are, that they feel loved. First, by you, the God of love. And also, from their church family, from me. I ask, Father, that you would strengthen each one of us. Equip us each day. Don't let us worry about tomorrow. That's not here yet. And let us not actually look back at yesterday because that's past. Let us focus on today and the now. And give to us, Lord, that which you would, by teaching us, encouraging us, strengthening us, leading us. So we come now, Lord, and we give it all to you. We cast our cares upon you, and we ask, Father, that you carry them. They're too much for us. But we rejoice also, for we have a special relationship with you, one that gives us hope, a future, and a promise. And because of all that, Lord, we're grateful. We have joy unexpressible, joy the world does not know. And we have joy in spite of our circumstances. We rise above everything, Lord. We, we ignore the noise. And we come to you. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. So today, we'll be studying in Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to be reading verses 12 through 17. You would open your Bible. We read from the New American Standard Version. Turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 2. And I'll start with verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. We have a set of seven letters written to churches in Asia Minor. John the Apostle 
He's in exile on Patmos. Isn't it interesting that so often that God uses our periods of isolation, our exile, our imprisonment, to get us to focus on him? He uses his apostles. They write a lot of letters when they're not out doing the work of the Lord. And in this case, Revelation. And this is the third letter. Now, Pergamum is, is located north and inland of Smyrna. And in their city, they housed a well-developed university. Over 20,000 volumes or, uh, of, 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 of literature that they had. And they favored the Greek gods because of their pagan cults. They worshipped the likes of Athena, Asclepius, Diocinus, and Zeus. They worshipped war, medicine and healing, pleasure and dominance. And their favoritism towards secular education and these pagan rites made Christianity the enemy of the day. Yeah? Christianity was being castigated for being exclusionary moral and different. And it sounds kind of like the type of atmosphere that we live in today. Society, enlightened society, secular society, projects on Christianity, and they don't like us. So, Pergamum has that with us. Once again, starting in verse 12, it says to the angel of the church of Pergamum, right? Now, angel, as I explained earlier in our series, it means messenger, overseer, pastor. And I think this would be the first time I have ever been called an angel. <laughs> right, Gary? <laughs> now, first up is the description of Jesus Christ. It says here in verse 12 that he has a sharp two-edged sword. And then in verse 16 says, of his mouth. His mouth, that which he makes war with, that which he speaks truth. He defends us with his mouth, with his word, and he defeats the enemy with his sharp double-edged sword. And to me, that Christ uses his word as his defense or as his weapon does not surprise me at all. It's exactly the same manner in which he replied to Satan when he was tempted in the desert. Luke chapter 4 has this account. Three times Jesus was tempted by Satan, and three times Jesus responded with, It is written. It is written. It is written. And Satan lost each time that Jesus said, It is written. That's how it's done, actually. Knowing what God's position is on a subject. God has inspired men to write his book for us so that we're able to handle the hard questions, the trials and tribulations. And it gives us a hope for the future. Let me encourage you, don't be like Eve arguing with the serpent in the garden and losing the battle because she did not know exactly what God had really said. Was she present when God instructed Adam concerning the tree? Was Adam clear in his understanding of God's instructions? So was Eve brought up to speed with the economy of God concerning this rule of obedience? Doesn't matter. The only thing clear is that Eve did not know enough to defend herself when the evil one came lying. And my point being, we as believers have the same opportunity to base our decisions on the word of God. Now I'm going to wander a little farther from the passage. Scripture is part of our spiritual armor. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us to take up the full armor of God. And if you would, turn to Ephesians 6 and look particularly at verse 17 
where it talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, concerning this armor of God. The word picture here in Ephesians 6 is having all of these magnificent items of armor mounted on the wall, available for you to take down, put on. God tells us we will need all of them in doing spiritual warfare. A pro football player doesn't leave off and select only certain parts of his protective gear. He puts it all on, his helmet, his pads, his, his cup. Um, so why do we ignore the basic commands that are there in place to protect us and propel us for victory? Take it up. Truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, our salvation. I recommend to take note of this passage, Ephesians chapter 6, and take some time this week to go back over it and study the armor of God. Back to Revelation chapter 2. There's four parts to many of these letters. And the first part, well, the four parts are commendation and then rebuke, exhortation, and promise. God has spoken in an orderly fashion. In his first one in verse 13, the commendation by Christ says, I know where you live. Pergamum, I know your church. Now, he's not stating that, that it's a location, but he's talking about the conditions that they live in. I know what you're putting up with. I know how society is leaning against you. I know this is where Satan has his throne. Satan has got an inroad here in Pergamum through the philosophy and the secular education, to the paganness that exudes in this city. The church was born and grew, but the resistance from those who were there, the elitists, the enlightened. I know your conditions. I know your difficulty, Christ says, that you don't have it very pretty. Because it's where Satan has his throne, where Satan is dwelling. But the church says, held fast. You hold fast to the name of Jesus. They did not deny their faith. They are firmly committed to Christ. The word hold fast is that which is attached, does not easily get separated. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I... I thought of the, the old jingle, I'm stuck on Band-Aids because Band-Aids stuck on you. That's what's happened here, that God, or that the church is holding fast. They're stuck on Jesus. They won't let go. They did not deny him, even in persecution, when Antipas was killed. Nothing in history tells us about this event, but it must have been fresh in their minds for John to use it as an example. The name Antipas means against all. This was one who stood fast against all, even to the point of death. He was a faithful witness. Pergamum, the church, still holding fast. But even in that, there's a rebuke. Christ says in verses 14 and 15, there's some impurity amongst you. It says that they're holding to the teaching of Balaam. The New Living Testament, the New Living Testament uses the word tolerate when it talks about holding to these teachings. You tolerate some among you, but not just outsiders, but some of your own. Instead of holding fast to the name of Jesus, some of you are holding on to impurity. The teaching of Balaam, King Balak. That refers back in the Old Testament to Numbers chapters 22 through 25, and then also again in chapter 31. Balaam 
had been guilty of counseling King Balak to cause Israel to sin through the intermarriage with heathens, through idol worship. Intermarriage with women was also a problem at Pergamum. And the problem is they don't share the same faith. Intermarriage brings an additional social contact with the secular world. And that involved the worship of idols. And this was their habit, their activity. There's a second issue of food being offered to idols, which involved ritual annual, annual, ritual animal sacrifices and blessings to false gods. Those participating in this were involving themselves in an impure practice. Now, the eating of this food is different from 1 Corinthians chapter 8 because if you remember, there was an issue about eating food sacrificed to idols. But don't confuse it because the believers in Corinthians were not being involved in the ritual sacrifice. They merely ate out at a restaurant in the marketplace. That was the first rebuke of impurity. The second rebuke was that they were holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And this was a group of false religious teachers. Remember, the church at Ephesus also had this problem. Because in verse 6, if you look back in chapter 2 here, in verse 6, they simply didn't tolerate it. The way I see it, you have two choices in life. One is your, your first choice, and the best choice, is to flee from what God calls sin. Your second choice is you recognize it for what it is, hold on to it, embrace it, make it a part of who you are. But ignorance is not an option. That is not one of your choices. You either, one, bring you closer to God, or two, sabotage your relationship with God and other believers. The issue is what I believe is between sanctification and syncretism. Syncretism is when you combine different beliefs, different schools of thought. The Roman Catholic Church is syncretic because when it benefits them, they will modify what they do. And let me give you an example of why I say that. The establishment of the Catholic Church in South America as the Spanish explorers made their way down through South America, they wanted also to bring the Catholic religion with them into the villages. So what did they do? They built churches designated for their worship. They also incorporated on the steps that led up into the church, booths or, or altars on the side, small little alcoves. And what would happen is people, as they came up into the church, they would pause and make a tribute to their local god, the ones that they were used to worshiping. Now, the people liked it because it showed respect to their village gods. The Catholics permitted it because it grew their religion into the local culture, eventually supplants the planting, the practices of the villages. I'm going to tell you, though, you don't allow outside practices to substitute God. You don't just attend a church service just to attend a church service because that's what you do. It's traditional or watch one online. You worship God where you're at for the pure joy of being in the presence of God. You don't substitute form for the relationship. So you pursue sound doctrine. You hold fast your focus on heavenly things, and you live a morally pure lifestyle. To do this will guide you, it will protect you, you and your family, your church, and it honors God. 
Seek first the kingdom of God, right? Isn't that what the Bible says? And his righteousness. This is more than a suggestion or recommendation. It's a command. And if you look, you will see that this, tribu- this rebuke of the church of Pergamum was not an isolated issue. Let's briefly look into the church at Thyatira. And so cast your eyes down to verse 20. And it reads, I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Another church, similar circumstances and the rebuke was similar. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. The word tolerate And this passage means to give consent and to permit as a superior would do to a subordinate. You give them permission to do so. The fact of the matter is immorality was not forced on them. They allowed it and then they participated. The church at Thyatira was allowing for followers of Christ to be misled by a false prophetess. They call her Jezebel here. But uh, this is a woman who gained control with seduction, immorality, and idolatry. They compromised their doctrine, it affected their faith, and it ultimately pollutes their church. If you give this your attention, it will captivate you. Isn't it true the dog you feed will win the fight? These, both of these churches, they're dangerously hurting their relationship with God with their compromise and their corruption. And Scripture says this will bring judgment. This aspect of judgment we're going to discuss a little further detail next week. So let's look at the exhortation to Pergamum. This is the third part of the letter, starting at verse 16. It says, repent, or else I am coming quickly. God's purpose is to cleanse the sin from his people, to make war with them with the sword of my mouth. The first intent of God, though, is repentance. Read that. Repent. Turn aside. Turn from sin and back to God. But for those who refuse, don't be fooled. He is coming back to wage war, and he does not lose. Part four, the promise to Pergamum. To him who overcomes, verse 17. To him who overcomes, says, I will be to be, they will be to given some hidden manna. Now, Interesting, because that leaves a lot to think about. Christ certainly is the bread of life. But there's something to be said about pure food from God after they've been eating the defiled food from idols. God says he will satisfy you. He will nourish you. You don't have to go to a pagan feast. And there's something, I believe, that he's promising them in nourishment that means that he will be that who gives you the strength to get through tough times. There's this white stone with a new name. Warren Wiersbe in the Bible Exposition Commentary writes that a judge would place a white stone into a vessel to indicate his vote for an acquittal or a person on trial. But this also may refer to a white stone that would be a a special ticket to get into a special feast, an activity. Others have said that those are realistic expectations of of the, the culture of how they're using white stones. 
I don't have a, an answer. I wish I had a stone in my pocket that I could say that God gave me, but I don't. But I do know that God has my name written in his book of life. So I don't need a promise. I don't need a, a physical reminder of, of that. But my prayer is that as I, as I read through this message and prepared it for you, the hearer was to be convicted and moved enough for action. First of all, not to tolerate sin, not to get cozy with it, accept it until you're no longer offended by it. Verse 16, again, says, we have a decision to make concerning sin, sin in our life. And it's the same decision that the church had back then. Jesus says, repent, or I'm coming quickly. The last chapter in the Bible is Revelation chapter 22. And in this chapter, Jesus mentions three times that I am coming to you quickly. Three times. That's the strongest message that God gave us as he wrapped up his, his word to us. My question is, do you believe this? Sometimes we live, we act like we don't believe it. God is not coming quickly. But if you believe it, do you live like it? How has your life changed since you've become a Christian? I want to challenge you. Do you separate from immorality? That which hindered these two churches. Do you separate from immorality? And do you live a sanctified life? Which means separated, committed to God. And do you live this kind of life even when nobody is looking? If so, why does immorality have such a stronghold in our world today. Why? Let me give it a name. Why does pornography have such a stronghold and enslave so many? People don't like to preach about this, but I have nothing to lose. I want to share this. Statistics say 70% of men are involved with viewing pornography. And just like Pergama and Thyatira, immorality has embedded itself into our culture. It's a grip, and I know because it's one that I had to deal with. God had to lay it bare before me. And if I was to be his, to be used for his glory, something had to change. I had to repent and turn it over to him for his healing. And I want to tell you, he is the deliverer. So yesterday, as I was preparing, I typed the word pornography into my computer search engine. Now let me tell you, I have safe search on my computer, so nothing pops up to infect my computer or me. But that one word returned 332 million results. 332 million results. But then I typed in the word Bible and searched. I got more than double the amount of hits, 696 million results. What I'm getting at here is, even though the numbers may be off, there's a great opportunity for us to decide to not go into immorality, but to go into God, to choose and go no further and to say yes to God. And it all comes down to asking yourself, where do you stand on syncretism? Where do you allow things to mix in with your life, your faith? How much are you willing to hold on to God and to remove other things from your life? Let's just look at one example in entertainment. You know, good entertainment is hard to find these days. You have to be selective. My wife and I, every time a movie or a TV show comes on and they promote a homosexual or a gender-confused person, we stop watching the show. We turn it off. 
If it's a series, we're done with the series. This is our choice. Hollywood made their choice. We get a choice. Popular does not make it proper. Just because so many people are accepting of it. And I don't hate them for doing it. They're trapped. They're in the world. They don't know any better. And I'm often sad to be losing what I considered good shows, good entertainment. But if Hollywood has an agenda, and they do, I get to choose what my mind views. I can't tell you how many shows and movies I've dropped. Makes life simple, though, doesn't it? Pergamum was called out for their willingness to hold on to immorality. They had two choices, repent or deal with the righteous God who comes quickly to judge. Next week we'll go into the judgment side because the the church at Thyatira has more to add to this discussion. But let's close with a verse or passage from one of John's other writings. Turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 5 through 9. Once again, I want the Bible to add commentary, not just my words. Starting at verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And remember, this passage was written to believers, not unbelievers, not the world. But this was written to those who desire fellowship with God. After having said all this, as we transition into a time of communion, Perhaps there's a burden in your heart that you need to take to the Lord. This would be the time to do so. Because we evaluate ourselves, our walk, our life. Is it where God wants us to be? Or has there been a shift? And if so, just please know, God has not moved but we've wandered like sheep. So the good shepherd's asking for us, call, come back. Take this time of communion and make it a commitment. Father, we just want to uh, close in a brief word of prayer so that as we sing and worship to you, We can do so with a clean heart. We come before you, Lord. Our sin is already there. You see it for what it is. Lord, in our life, we may have allowed things to creep in, but now we're holding on to it. I, Father, pray that you expose sin for what it is in all areas. And Father, that I myself and those who are listening might feel the the guilt of it, the prompting of the Holy Spirit saying, it's time to give this up. It's time to make a choice. It's time to embrace the change. Because that, Lord, which you give us, 
you nourish us far more than the filth of this world. You clean us far better than the immorality around us. I pray, Father, for all, for my family, for my church. I pray for my friends that we all rise above. And Father, we reflect your light to a dark world. We commit this to you, Lord. We give it to you. We don't grab at it and try and pull it back into our life later on. But we remember the decisions that are being made right now. And that's what we hold on to. And I thank you, Father, for all this in Christ's name. Amen. Change my heart over again Make it ever true Change my heart over So as we come to communion time, I want to remind us of what happened that night. Jesus met with his disciples, and he took the bread. Here, let me do this way. He took the bread, and he broke it. It's not turned on. Um, and he passed it among his disciples, and he said to them that, they were to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Paul, in commentating on this, said, every man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat the bread and drink of the cup. So take advantage of this time. Be quiet before God. Examine your life and ask God for forgiveness for any sin that you hadn't dealt with. And partake of communion with a clean heart and a pure conscience. Brian, our elder, uh, would you please offer the prayer for the bread? Lord God, I just ask for, uh, you know, thank you for what you've done and thank you for your sacrifice that you did so long ago. And I pray we take this moment to uh, reflect upon what you did for us 
as we uh, take this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus took the bread, passed around, and said, Take, eat, this is a remembrance of my, br- my body, which is broken for you. Let's eat together. In the same manner, he took the, the cup and that he shared it around with his disciples. I would like to ask our other elder, Larry, to come on microphone so that those who are participating at home and abroad, that they would uh, also hear the prayer thanking Jesus for our, the blood that he shed on the cross for us. Please, would you ask? Okay, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for this day you've given us to worship you. And we thank you that you loved us enough to to die, to shed your blood for our sin. And we just ask you to help us remember that every day as, as we go about our business. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And in the same way, he took the cup after they'd eaten, and he said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let us drink together. Paul said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So oh. 